Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jim Gardner. I'm uh, executive, the executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries and Museum Services here at the National Archives. Um, welcome to uh, those of you who uh, brave the weather uh, to join us today in the, in the William G. McGowan Theater uh, for today's book discussion. Uh, John Quincy Adams, Militant Spirit, with our, our speaker, James Traub. Uh, and welcome to those of you who are watching, um, joining us uh, via the National Archives YouTube channel, uh, and welcome as well to C-SPAN. Uh, before we get to today's program, I'd like to tell you um, about some upcoming programs. On Wednesday, April 13th, at 7 p.m., we will present a panel discussion, African American Life in Washington, D.C. Before Emancipation. Uh, that will um, explore uh, <coughs> life before the 1862 Compensated Emancipation Act and discuss the Slavery and Freedom exhibit that's under development uh, for the uh, soon-to-open National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, our program is presented in partnership uh, with the Museum of African American History and Culture, the D.C. Commission on African American Affairs, and the D.C. Commission on Emancipation. Then on Thursday, April 21st at 7 p.m., we will be uh, screening uh, the recent documentary, Eye on the 60s, the iconic photography of Rowland Sherman. Uh, the film offers an intimate portrait of the former Life magazine photographer and how his photographic eye captured the essence of the remarkable and turbulent decade of the 60s. Following the screening, uh, there will be a, a discussion featuring filmmaker Chris Suido and Edith Lee Payne, um, who as a 12-year-old girl uh, was the subject of one of Sherman's most famous images taken at the March on Washington. To find out more about these and all our public programs, please consult our monthly calendar of events available in the theater lobby or visit us online at www.archives.gov. Uh, James Traub is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, where he has worked since 1998, and is a regular columnist for foreignpolicy.com. His books include The Best Intentions, Coffee and Anne, and The UN in the Era, of American world power, uh, The Devil's Playground, A Century of Pleasure and Profit in Times Square, City on a Hill, and The Freedom Agenda. In his view, review of uh, John Quincy Adams' Militant Spirit, Sean Wolentz, um, author of uh, The Rise of American Democracy, Jefferson to Lincoln, wrote, uh, James Traub's new biography of John Quincy Adams is especially strong. Adams was a complicated hero, a patrician visionary, but also, as Traub puts it, a militant spirit, one of the most important diplomats in all of American history, and finally, slavery's greatest enemy in American politics. Traub does justice to both the man and his times with a historian's sense of complexity and a writer's eye for drama and detail. Uh, after his talk and question and answer, assuming we have time, uh, uh, Mr. Traub will be signing copies of his book, One Level Up, uh, outside the <clears throat> National Archives store. Uh, please welcome James Traub. Uh, to the National Archives. Thank you very much for that introduction. So when I was 
coming here this morning, and I was taking the taxi to Penn Station in New York, every bus I passed had a giant sign on the side that said, Hamilton. And so naturally I thought, well, what if Lin-Manuel Miranda, the producer and writer and star of the show, came to me and said, well, Jim, I've, I've done the Hamilton hip hop thing. Uh, what do you got for me with John Quincy Adams? So I thought, I need to have a story to tell him. So um, this is the first uh, book event I've done for my book. So I'm going to tell you the story that I would tell him if he ever came to me to ask. So on Saturday, January 21st, 1842, John Quincy Adams, who was then 74 years old, the former President of the United States, the former Secretary of State, a former senator and diplomat, and now a member of the US House of Representatives from Massachusetts, decided to provoke a confrontation with the slaveholders who dominated the Congress. For the previous seven years, Adams had waged a lonely and often solitary struggle to protect the right of citizens to petition Congress for an end to slavery or to the slave trade. That right was guaranteed by the Constitution, but slaveholders, <clears throat> resolutely unwilling to allow the peculiar institution to become a matter of public debate, passed what was known as the gag order to prevent such petitions from being presented. Every year, Adams and a few others had presented such petitions. And every year, the slaveholders and allies among the free states had passed a new gag order. And once again, in December 1841, at the beginning of that term of Congress, the gag had been passed. And once again, Adams had insisted on testing it by bringing one petition after another to the floor of the House under the pretext that they did not technically fall within the compass of the gag order. So on the 21st, he presented a particularly exacerbating such petition, and the slaveholders finally lost all patience. The abolitionist Theodore Dwight Weld wrote to his wife to describe the scene at that moment, which I will now read a little excerpt from. Weld writes, Wise of Virginia, Rainer of North Carolina, W.C. Johnson of Maryland, and scores more of slaveholders, striving constantly to stop him by starting questions of order and every now and then screaming at the top of their voices. That is false. I demand, Mr. Speaker, that you put him down. What are we to sit here and endure such insults? I demand that you shut the mouth of that old harlequin. That gives you a sense of the temper of Congress in those days. A perfect uproar like Babel would burst forth every two or three minutes as Mr. A, with his bold surgery, would smite his cleaver into the very bones. At least half of the slaveholding members of the House left their seats and gathered in the quarter of the hall where Mr. A stood. Whenever any of them broke in upon him, Mr. A would say, I see where the shoe pinches, Mr. Speaker. It will pinch more yet. I'll deal out to the gentlemen a diet they'll find it hard to digest. If before I get through every slaveholder, slave trader, and slave breeder on this floor does not get materials for bitter reflection, it shall be no fault of mine. On Monday, the 23rd, Adams picked up where he'd left off, again reading one anti-slavery petition after another. This time, the speaker ordered him to his chair. Adams refused, kept on his feet, hours on end. His few allies, including the anti-slavery champion Joshua Giddings of Ohio, gathered protectively by his side. The leaders of the slave factions got up from their seats to hover nearby lest they miss a word of the old man's increasingly quavery voice, and of course also to throw those insults at him that Weld had described. And now Adams pulled another page from a sheaf of papers that he held close to his chest. And he turned to the speaker, and he said the following. He said, I hold in my hand the memorial, which is to say petition, 
of Benjamin Emerson and 45 other citizens of Haverhill in the state of Massachusetts, praying Congress to adopt immediate measures for the peaceful dissolution of the union of these states. The petitioners no longer wished to see the resources of the free states drained, as they put it, for the benefit of the slave states. Well, the slaveocracy, which is the word Adams used to describe those people, had been waiting for a sufficient provocation to move against Adams. Adams had now provided it. And Henry Wise of Virginia now rose to propose a resolution to censure the former president, very grave punishment. Adams replied, good. And you should think about that word. He said, good. He wasn't thinking about the trial that was to come. He wasn't thinking about the possible humiliation that, of being censured. He was delighted. It was a war that he had sought, and he had gained, and he looked forward to it. In an uproar, the House then adjourned. Let me now back up a little bit and explain how Adams had come to this point in his quite extraordinary career. So like virtually all New Englanders, Adams was profoundly opposed to slavery and considered it a gross violation both of American Republican principles and of Christian principles as well. But he also considered slavery to be, in effect, a settled issue. The Constitution had been silent on it. States were free to do as they wish. There was essentially nothing that the federal government could do or, from Adams's point of view, should do about slavery. His views only began to change in 1820. 1820 was the era of what we now call the Missouri Compromise. And what happened then was there were then 22 states, 11 free and 11 slave. And Missouri petitioned to gain entrance to the Union as a slave state, which of course would have destabilized the balance. And that provoked a huge debate. Also, Missouri was far enough north that there was a strong case to be made that it should be entered as a, a free state, because all the other free states were at that latitude or above. And a tremendous debate broke out in the Congress. And uh, Adams, of course, at this time, he was Secretary of State. He had no, no place in that debate. Uh, but he, he watched that debate, and he felt the debate was being dominated by the Southerners, who then had many highly regarded, eloquent speakers. And it was deeply frustrating to him. He wished that he could speak, but he couldn't. Instead, he raised the issue in the cabinet. The cabinet at that time consisted almost entirely of Southerners, of slaveholders. This was the cabinet of James Monroe. And Adams was slapped down. Afterwards, he took a walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, probably only a few blocks from where we are today, with John Calhoun, who was the Secretary of War. John Calhoun would go on to become the great ideologue, an intellectual justifier of slavery. But Adams had a lot of regard for Calhoun. Calhoun was a brilliant man. And Adams, at that time, considered Calhoun to be a person of tremendous intellectual integrity. And Adams continued to talk, as was his wont. And Calhoun listened to him and said, we well, you know those are those are very noble principles. But where I come from, we think those principles only apply to white people, not to black people. And Adams went home that night. Adams had a diary. He kept a diary every day of his life. It was quite extraordinary. For me, a you know, great resource for someone in my position. And he would write down, sometimes almost verbatim, the conversations that happened that day if he thought they were important. So he, he um, went back home, and at some point began to write. And he was thinking about the fact that a man as gifted as Calhoun, whom he admired so much, could sincerely hold views that Adams found repellent, and at least to him, self-evidently false. There was a larger truth in this, one that had not presented itself to Adams until now. Transcribing his train of thought as it came to him, Adams wrote that the practice of slavery taints the very sources of moral principle. It perverts human reason and reduces men endowed with logical powers to maintain that slavery is sanctioned by the Christian religion. The impression produced upon my mind by the progress of this discussion 
is that the bargain between freedom and slavery contained in the Constitution of the United States is morally and politically vicious. This was an astonishing conclusion for a man who had been raised from the earliest moment of consciousness to regard union as the supreme good, who had devoted his career as a diplomat and a politician to defending the integrity of the United States against foreign and domestic threats. Adams was a Burkean conservative who feared and abhorred revolutionary upheaval. Yet he had reasoned himself into a, into a position that was too honest to reason himself out of. Later that year, as the negotiations over Missouri continued, uh, the state the legislature passed a law that banned free people of color from the state. Literally said, even if you are a free person, you cannot come into the state if you are a person of color. And this enraged Adams, and I think maybe kind of burst the last stays that were holding in his, his deepest feelings. Um, he saw this as a provocation to the free states, of course, but also to the very cause of human freedom. And a, a friend of his, a colleague, uh, came to talk to him about it. And, and Adams then, in his diary, records what he said to this man. And I'll just read you a little piece of this. It's quite astonishing. So thinking about the slaves, and indeed thinking about not just enslavement, but racism in a way that I think is surprising for a man from his place. He didn't know any black people. The only ones he knew were servants. And yet there was an act of sympathy. He understood. And this is what he wrote. Weak and defenseless as they are, so much the more sacred is the obligation of the legislatures of the states to which they belong to defend their lawful rights. And I would defend them should the dissolution of the union be the consequence. For it would not be the defense, it would be the violation of their rights to which all the consequences would be imputable. And if the dissolution of the union must come, let it come from no other cause than this. If slavery be the destined sword in the hand of the destroying angel, which is to sever the ties of the union, the same sword will cut it sunder, will cut in sunder, I'm sorry, the bonds of slavery itself. A dissolution of the union for the cause of slavery would be followed by a servile war in the slaveholding states, combined with a war between the two severed portions of the Union. It seems to me that its result must be the extirpation of slavery from this whole continent. And calamitous and desolating as this course of events in its progress must be, so glorious would be its final issue that as God shall judge me, I dare not say that it is to be denied. So that was Adams in 1820 writing to himself, not, not speaking to anybody else, not saying this. And indeed, as pre as for the, the remainder of his tenure as Secretary of State, as President, he said nothing about slavery, either in his diary or to others. It remained a, a non-issue for him. It was a, it was a kind of buried issue that obviously remained inside him, but it was not the focus of his career. So after he was beaten for re-election by Andrew Jackson in 1828 and returned home, he then went back to Congress in 1831. He's the, he was the first president to ever return to Congress, and he in, it remains to this day the only president to have served in the House of Representatives after the presidency. By now, an anti-slavery movement had begun in the United States. By 1835, activists had begun preparing and sending to the very few sympathetic congressmen petitions calling for an end to the slave trade or the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia over which the federal government had jurisdiction. That's when Southerners began to call for the gag order. Now Adams was too harsh a realist to believe that in an open public debate, Southerners would, would, would acknowledge the evil of slavery and agreed to its abolition. He did not think that was possible. He had said to himself, and he still believed, that only civil war would bring an end to slavery. And now, when it was a reality, he could not say out loud what he had said to himself. He could not bring him to say that the idea of civil war was acceptable, something which only the most extreme radical abolitionists would adopt. 
So he was in a quandary. He didn't have doubts about the merits of the question. He didn't know how to get there. He didn't know what he as a congressman could do. I think he thought that the petition issue was a way to force into public debate the question of slavery and therefore at least expose the full horror of the practice. I don't think he thought that, that would end slavery, but he think, I think he thought it was the best he could do. But beyond that, uh, Adams was what we would now call a First Amendment absolutist. And that question for him took the form of petitions. Now, it's not easy for us to understand now, why, now why petitions would matter so much. But remember, at that time, there were no lobbies. There were no special interest groups. There were no write-in campaigns, there were no, obviously no internet. There was no way that citizens could have their voices heard except through the act of voting. Petitions were the way that they could do that. And in Adam's own mind, the word petition also had a, a kind of additional resonance. Even the most humble servant can petition the king or the, or the emir, and even the most dictatorial government. How could you deny the citizen of a democracy the right to a petition? So for Adams, these two issues, the issue of the petition and of free speech, and the issue of slavery converged to make a thing so powerful that it would seize him really for the rest of his time in Congress and therefore for the rest of his life. And so from that time forward, this became a kind of a mania, an obsession for Adams. And he was prepared to stand up when, when nobody else was. And indeed, it's worth saying that many other men who shared Adams' views felt that it was foolish, reckless, pointless to wage a battle over this issue in Congress because you'd never succeed. The Congress was really dominated by slaveholders, thanks in part to the so-called three-fifths compromise in the, in the Constitution. Uh, talking about slavery would achieve nothing. It would just gum up the works of Congress. And so other people wouldn't do it. And Adams said, I don't care. I I'll do it by myself. And so in every new session, Adams would present petitions. The Southerners would vote the gag order. Adams would try to get around it. A fight would ensue until in 1837, Adams presented a petition that purported to come from slaves themselves, which was an unspeakable violation from the point of view of the slave owners, as he knew. The idea that slaves might have the opportunity, the right, to petition Congress. If they had that right, what other rights might they have? So the fact is the petition was a fraud. Adams knew it was a fraud. It probably was sent to set him up because somebody knew he would present it. And not only that, the petition didn't call for the end of slavery. It was the opposite. The petition from these alleged slaves called for the preservation of slavery because slaves liked slavery. That's what the petition said. But Adams didn't reveal that when he presented the petition. This is still back in 1837. So all the other congressmen knew was that he was presenting a petition from slaves, presumably demanding an end to slavery. So Adams defended this thing. He said, um, of course he would present a petition from a slave. He said, I would present a petition from a horse or a dog if it had the power of speech and of writing. OK, this was the first confrontation. This provoked the first attempt to censure Adams, which I won't describe, but it went on for several weeks. Adams dominated the debate. He decimated the opposition. And by the time he was done, only 22 of the 238 members in the House voted for censure. OK, now we come forward five years, when the memory of that humiliation, perhaps, uh, has faded. And so by this time, there is a sizable abolitionist movement. And there are other abolitionist or anti-slavery legislators in Congress. So this group, the activists, the congressmen, they all room together in one rooming house. It was called Abolition House. Uh, Theodore Weld, great anti-slavery uh, orator, and, and writer, essayist, uh, took a desk in the Library of Congress and served as the group's head of research. Others saw to the printing and distribution of anti-slavery tracts. But Adams was the leader of the group in Congress. Nobody questioned that. And he said to Weld that he would present petitions that would set the slaveholders in a blaze. And that is what he did on January 21st, 1842. Now, of course, the Southerners had also learned from their mistakes of five years ago. So this time, they caucused as a group. They said, let's appoint 
a chief prosecutor. And so they chose Thomas Marshall. Thomas Marshall was the nephew of John Marshall, the great and revered Supreme Court Chief Justice. He was also a highly regarded uh, lawyer, an orator, a moderate, a member of the Whig Party, and so the perfect person to represent their point of view so that it didn't simply seem like slavery against anti-slavery. So several days later, I think it was probably January uh, 25th, um, Marshall began to speak. And it was an astonishing spectacle. This was an immense event. Crowds filled the galleries of the House long before the noon opening of the session. Giddings noted that foreign ministers, attaches, and privileged persons filled the lobbies in the outer space within the hall and outside the bar. The speaker called on Marshall, who read a resolution to censure Adams. In his version, though, he had raised the stakes considerably. Whereas, he asserted, a dissolution of the Union necessarily implies the destruction of the Constitution, the overthrow of the Republic, and the violation of the legislator's own oath, the petition Adams had presented compelled the members to perjure themselves and involve the crime of high treason. Adams deserved expulsion. Censure, said Marshall, was an act of grace and mercy. This would prove to be a catastrophic overreach on Marshall's part. Marshall delivered an indictment he prefaced by long expressions of regard for Adams himself and for his, his family and for their place in history. He therefore professed himself astounded when such a revered figure presented to the House so monstrous a document, and not only presented that document, but sought to have it referred to committee, thus leading to the conclusion that the dissolution of the Union was a fair subject to be considered by the House. Marshall's professions of neutrality and his rhetorical command had cheered his colleagues and left Adams' supporters depressed in a corresponding degree, Giddings wrote. Both sides waited with excruciating anticipation for the old man's response. With all eyes on him, <clears throat> Adams rose slowly, looking about him at friend and foe, and at last said to the speaker, it is no part of my intention to reply to the gentleman from Kentucky at this time. That was a startling remark. What then was his intention? I call, Adams went on, for the reading of the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. The clerk began to read. When in the course of human events, when he slowed, uncertain where to stop, Adams cried, proceed, proceed. <clears throat> the clerk continued. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. And then, at Adams' order, came to a stop at it is their right, it is their duty <clears throat> to throw off such government. John Quincy Adams' father had played a central role in writing the Declaration of Independence. John Quincy himself had been very much alive at the time. His adversary, Thomas Marshall, was a young pup of 40. Adams was reminding his audience, which had come to see him as a fanatic and a monomaniac, of his own connection to the nation's founding documents and principles, and more than that, of just what those principles were. Was it high treason, he now went on, to advocate the dissolution of the government? Never mind the declaration had been written to justify the dissolution of colonial dominion. The real danger to the republic, Adams continued, came not from petitioners but from slaveholders. There was a concerted system and purpose to destroy all the principles of civil liberty in the free states. The right of habeas corpus and the right of trial by jury were at risk. So, of course, was the right of petition. Weld, admittedly the most biased of spectators, wrote that old Nestor had demonstrated a calm fearlessness and majesty that furnished the highest illustration of the moral sublime that I ever witnessed in a popular secular assembly. Now, Henry Wise rose to deliver a rebuttal. Wise was an intemperate man. He didn't have Marshall's degree of restraint. And he delivered a fiery, blistering, ugly attack on Adams personally, on Adams' father, what he called the House of Braintree. That was where they were from. 
very violent. Adams kept his cool for two days. So when Adams finally rose to speak, he made a very ingenious argument about Virginia, where Henry Wise was from, which was also designed, again, to remind everyone who John Quincy Adams was. It grieved him from the very soul to see these propositions come from Virginia. If there was a state in this union for which even now he felt an attachment greater than to any other except his native state, it was to Virginia. In his earlier years, it was from Virginia that he was introduced into the service of this nation, first by George Washington, who had appointed him as a diplomat, whose warning voice had been repeated here to operate against him, and which voice had been to him from the time it was delivered down to this moment, next to the Holy Scriptures on his heart and mind. Then Adams turned back to John Marshall, to, I'm sorry, to Thomas Marshall. And now he exchanged his dignified tone for brutal mockery. The Constitution of the United States, he observed, says what high treason is, and it is not for him or his puny mind to define what high treason is and to confound it with what I have done. Adams suggested that Marshall attend some law school in order to learn a little of the rights of the citizens of those states and the members of this house. Did he not understand that treason and the subornation of perjury were crimes rather than simply censurable offenses, and that any man accused of them had the right to trial before an impartial jury? Was a jury of slaveholders impartial? Adams was beating the South yet again, and this time with the whole world watching. He was gleeful. That night, Weld came to visit Adams at home and found him as fresh and elastic as a boy, though he had scarcely slept for days. I'm all ready for another heat, he declared. And with that, Adams began reciting his planned speech for the following day, accompanied by all the gestures and facial expressions he would be using before his auditors. The flabbergasted abolitionist tried to warn Adams against wasting his energy, but the old man was unstoppable. He went on for an hour or nearly that, Weld wrote to his wife in a voice loud enough to be heard by a large audience. Wonderful man. At this point, Southerners began to retreat. Marshall then took the floor to say he had actually never meant to charge Adams with treason. Wise took the floor to say he had actually never even supported the censure resolution. Marshall then turned on Wise before attacking Adams once again. At this point, more than a week had gone by. The House had accomplished no business whatsoever. And on February 2nd, Adams rose to say that actually he hadn't yet begun his defense. And he would need weeks more to gather documents and testimony. At this point, another Southern congressman offered to drop the resolution, the censure resolution, if Adams would withdraw the original petition. Adams, of course, indignantly refused. And he continued to hold the floor. On February 7th, after two weeks, Marshall ran up the white flag. He put the resolution to a vote knowing that it would lose, and it did, 106 to 93. Adams' response? He immediately introduced 200 anti-slavery petitions. <laughs> Adams had shattered the overweening confidence of the South. Giddings overheard Marshall tell a colleague, I would rather die a thousand deaths than again to encounter that old man. Nor did he have to, for Marshall retired after that se session of Congress. Wise later called Adams the acutest, the astutest, the archest enemy of Southern slavery that ever existed. It was not, of course, a merely individual defeat. Weld called the censure vote the first victory over the slaveholders in a body ever yet achieved since the foundation of the government. And this was not pure hyperbole. 
the South had fought a pitched battle over petitions and lost. Two more years would have to pass before the House defeated the gag rule, but as of that moment, Southern resistance was spent. The mistake of the abolitionists, however, was to believe that slavery could not survive a crushing defeat in the court of public opinion. Weld boldly predicted that from this time, slavery's downfall takes its date. Adams knew better. He knew that slave owners would never voluntarily surrender their most precious property and the foundation of their way of life. So well, what do we learn about Adams from this episode? First, of course, that he was fearless in a fight. He would fight dirty if he needed to. He would be unfair if he needed to. He could speak in the loftiest register, and he could engage in savage personal attacks. He was an extraordinarily clear-headed man, but with a vehemence that, went, that brought him to the point of unbridled ferocity. That is the meaning of the subtitle of my book. You can see from this episode his militant spirit. So these gifts were the ones that were both his great source of achievement and his great source of failure. His brilliant insight into men and affairs had made him America's leading diplomat at a very young age. His principled intransigence, his indefatigable energies, had made him a great secretary of state. But that same stubbornness, that self-righteousness, that contempt for compromise and for the business of politics made him a terrible president. He was a man who had a very bold agenda and achieved nothing, or virtually nothing. The presidency was the least successful part of his career. And of course, he was beaten after one term by Andrew Jackson, who was far more popular and far more skilled as a politician. Now, of course, at that point, it seemed that his career was over. And yet he had this last extraordinary final phase where he served in Congress for the last 16 years uh, of his life. By the, time he, by, the, by the time the gag order was overturned in 1845, he was revered as a hero. This man who had been thought of as a kind of old fossil was, was really revered as, a, as the last link to the, the founders and their great virtues. At his death in 1848, there were, of course, a tremendous outpouring of eulogies. And the most interesting one to me it wasn't even technically a eulogy. It wasn't delivered in a church. It was delivered in a theater uh, by Theodore Parker. Theodore Parker was a radical theologian, a transcendentalist, a friend of Emerson's, brilliant, brilliant man, strange, difficult, um, ornery. And he allowed himself to be very critical of his subject because it wasn't a technical eulogy. Shall we tell lies about him because he's dead? Parker asked his audience. He would not. Parker noted that as Secretary of State and President, Adams had remained mute on slavery. He was what is called a good hater, Parker rightly noted, and he used his wit tyrannously. He was a poor poet. His greatest intellectual faculty was memory, and he showed little foresight. In what, then, did John Quincy Adams' greatness lie? In this, Parker said, that throughout all his words and acts, ran a golden thread, an intense love of freedom for all men. And then Parker summoned up that moment in 1842 when Adams stood in the well of the house on the issue of slavery and petitions. And this is what he said. He said, I know a few things in modern times so grand as that old man standing there in the House of Representatives the compeer of Washington, a man who had borne himself proudly in king's courts, early doing service in high places where honor may be won, a man who had filled the highest office in any nation's gift, a president's son, himself a president, standing there, the champion of the neediest of the oppressed. And that was John Quincy Adams. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, there are microphones set up on either side. 
So please uh, go to the microphone, and of course, I'd be happy to talk about anything about Adams, whether it's what I was talking about or some other thing altogether. Sir. I know that Lincoln was one term in the House. Was he in the House at this time? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so there, there is a kind of uh, tantalizing overlap. They must have known each other. They saw each other. Lincoln's first term was Adams's last term. Lincoln was there when Adams died. And when Adams' uh, casket was taken from Washington northwards on a train to be buried in Quincy, Massachusetts, an honor guard of two representatives from each state was included. And Abraham Lincoln was one of those men. So for those of us who like to see a fair amount of Adams in Lincoln, uh, both in some of the arguments Lincoln used about slavery, but also in the activist government that, that Adams had talked about, that in many ways Lincoln brought to pass, that is the one symbolic point of contact. Yes? How did the media treat all of this? You mean the media of the day? The media of the day. So um, it's a great question because, of course, the word media, you know, obviously our own word, media, and then in that case meant there were a fair number of court reporters. By the 1840s, a lot of papers, there were tens of thousands of newspapers in America. No country had ever had so many newspapers. And a number of them, not a lot, I don't know how many, a couple dozen maybe, had reporters in, in, uh, in Washington. And so this was big news in all of the papers. Uh, and for the abolitionist press, and by then there were some number of thousands of explicitly abolitionist newspapers. This was huge. And we should remember, I didn't talk about the famous Amistad case, where Adams, before the Supreme Court, defended a group of, of, of Africans who had been taken in slavery and won the case seven to one. That already made Adams a hero. This really cemented his reputation. So it was a very, it was a very big deal in that part of the case. Were they favorable? I mean, I, I guess my question is, yeah. editorial, editorially, um, were the media, and, and particularly in some cases, I'm quite curious about the media of the South. Right, so the uh, answer is you could have, you, I, first of all, I should say that I only read a small number of newspapers, so I only know what I've read. Of those, you could very easily predict their editorial position because newspapers were either pro or anti-slavery. And so newspapers in the South despised this man. I mean, he, Adams had received innumerable death threats in the late 1830s from Southerners who felt that he was the greatest danger posed to slavery. And he was, Adams was hated. And so the Southern press would have vilified him. Uh, the more timid Northern press, you know, I can't really say. And then the abolitionist press, of course, felt he, he was a great champion. Yes, sir. Um, going back to Mr. Lincoln. Oh, yeah. Would you expand on John Quincy Adams' role? And I think he was about well, the first person to develop the idea that of the military necessity justification for the, uh, uh, the abolition of slavery. Because I believe uh, that during the 1830s, that the South started to talk about secession, he warned them that if, they were, if it came to war, uh, the North would be able to have a military justification for coming in and abolishing slavery right. as because, a war measure. Because uh, once the South had threatened the Union, then the North, if it saw the military value of freeing the slaves, would have every right to do so. The North, in effect, would then have the right to override the restraints on federal conduct that were written in the Constitution. And so Adams said that quite explicitly in the late 1830s or early 1840s. And it's certainly thought that Lincoln had adopted that reasoning when he announced the Emancipation Proclamation. So that's the kind of one link in the logical chain on the slavery issue that connects uh, those two. Well, all right, if there are no other questions, uh, then I'm very happy to sign books for those of you who would like to buy one upstairs. So thank you so much.